Blessed be the name of the Lord this morning. Good to know him, isn't it? To believe that there is a God. To believe that he knows you. You're part of his plan. And whatever we need today, he's more than able to supply that. But you know, we don't come just because we have a need. We come because he's Lord. You know, even if he doesn't supply our needs, he's still worthy of all of our worship. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I was touched a moment ago whenever it was mentioned about Sister Rosa. Rosie, are you here this morning? Would you come down here, dear? I don't know if a lot of you folks know Sister Rosa or not, but she's a miracle. She she doesn't mind me telling this because God gets all the glory, but Two or three decades ago, she lived over in Southern California, Arizona. That time she had a bunch of little children. She wasn't really serving the Lord. And she got involved with some people who hired her to be a mule to transport dope from Mexico into America. And because she was a mother and she had little children, she could go back and forth across the border. She did that. She got caught because she's a daughter of God. Children of God can't get away with anything. They get caught every time. She was put in federal prison. And while she's in prison, Sister Hope Sanchez, who her husband was a dope dealer, was sent to prison because she wouldn't testify against her husband. And we know Hope's supernatural testimony. But while Hope was in prison, she witnessed to this lady. Now, if she had not been arrested and put in prison, she'd have never known this message. Now then, she's come here. She's lived among us for all these years. She's run her business. She's started off being a seamstress. She had a company that made dresses. Then she and some of these sisters got into what we call the elder care home business. And she's very successfully run these homes for years. Working many of you people, your children, your parents, others that she's taken care of when you couldn't afford it. But now the government's come along and required new licensing and agencies. And when they ran a background check on her, they found out she was a dangerous criminal. (laughs) And now then, the regulations say that she cannot own a business that takes care of the elderly. And I don't think it's fair. She's not dangerous. She's very faithful to this church. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what she, all she's done because let God get the glory for that, but she's very charitable. She's very faithful in her tithes and her offerings. And we have an opportunity to see God do a miracle in the hearts of some officials. And so I wanted to share that with you because tomorrow after she goes to court and the ruling comes back in her favor, then we want to give God the glory for it. God bless you, Sister Rosie. In the name of the Lord Jesus, give you peace and comfort with this tomorrow. You know that you know your heart. You know how you feel. You know, the desire of it that you've only been there to help people. You haven't done it for the money. I know that. But you, you've been faithful in what you have done. And you've been a blessing to many of us and your family. And I ask God to give you peace in your heart tomorrow. That when you go, that the words you say 
It'll touch the hearts of those that make this decision that you can again be an example as a child and a daughter of Almighty God. And I say amen because I believe it. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Bring us the good news. Okay? God bless you. I believe God, don't you? I know that people in authority, they have rules and regulations, but I think many times there's circumstances they don't know. Those are there to keep people from being victimized by criminals, but she don't fit in that category at all. My, my wife is not here this morning. This morning about 2 o'clock she was up checking on me in the bedroom because she heard me up and she wanted to know if there's anything she could do for to help me, my, my legs had that restless feeling and I had to wake up and work on my legs some so I could get the circulation or something back so I could go back to sleep. And I could tell in her voice she was enthused about this morning because she felt so good. But this morning about 6.30 when I saw her, she said, what happened? And this morning she just, she just didn't have it. She just didn't feel like even getting up. So... Something is wrong with my wife. I don't know whether it's uh, mental or depression or chemical imbalance or something. But my daughter Karen talked her into going and getting a blood test this week. So we went Thursday to get that and we're due to get the results about Wednesday. So pray for us that we'll be able to find out what's happening to Sister Green with her imbalance or something. And The Lord willing, and she feels like it, I'm going to take her to Williams this afternoon. Now, I'm doing this for two reasons. First of all, the Frank family is with us, and they want to go to the Grand Canyon this week. And I wanted Sister Green to go to see Karen. And the only way I can get her to do any traveling is do it in the afternoons when she feels better. It seems that she does better in the late afternoons and the early hours of the night than she does any other time. So... We're going to go this afternoon and come back tomorrow afternoon. So I ask you to pray for us. And Brother Robert's going to be preaching for you tonight. Continuing that series that he's got started on the virtues. Uh, I don't think that's, that's anything that would hurt any of us to know more about. Because we're supposed to have those in our lives. Uh, please remember to pray for that. And let me, let me bring you an update on the Sharp family. Ray and Denise. You know, they came here and. Ray was, Ray was supernaturally touched in Israel. And when he gets back up to Idaho there with the RV park where they're staying, the people just can't believe it's the same person. And Ray has, for the past two years, he's had a, a real burden to tell everybody about the Lord and the message. And he's baptized about 12 people up there. <clears throat> that's, that's more than a lot of us have done down here to witness to somebody that didn't even know. But at this time, he's involved with a group of people up there that they're Mennonites. And the Mennonite pastor has, uh, has met Ray, and Ray has met him, and Ray and Denise have been visiting the Mennonite church. And, you know, they're, they're very humble people. They're, they're people that they live holiness. They, they sit separate in church, and Ray and Denise, when they went to church, they honored that. And this impressed those people. And the minister in preaching, well, when he makes a point that's true, well, Ray feels like saying amen. So Ray, Ray apologized to him for the way he felt, and the, the pastor took him aside and said, please do it more often. I, we need more of that. Uh, so I feel that God is using them to do something among a group of people that's very sincere in serving the Lord and denying their flesh and living a life of holiness in this world in which we live. In fact, we have invited those people to come down here and and spend some time with us. And when they do, I have felt led to invite Brother Byler from uh, Kentucky that was a former uh, Mennonite himself and a friend of Brother uh, Bernard's, uh, Ivan Harberger, that he went down in Florida and has moved back to the Arkansas area. And so I I feel if we get these people to come, I want to bring these believers that were former Mennonites here. And you know, really, it's just Christians. 
you know, we so often become denominated ourselves because this is a message or, or, or this is a Baptist or, or this was a Mennonite. But you know what? We're all people looking for the coming of the Lord. Amen. That, that's what it should be in our lives. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I, I do not have the dates or the total cost yet for Israel, but I should have it by next Sunday, the Lord willing. But I do know that the dates are going to be uh, between March the 18th and the 31st. Uh, that's what I have requested. I wanted, I wanted to start it on the 18th if I could so that we'll have two Sabbaths in there and two weekends there. And, and that's a 14-day tour. That's not an eight-day tour. Uh, you, you just can't get it done in seven days. You can go there and see some of it, but if you want to go and see all of Jerusalem and the northern part of the country, you need at least 10 days in the country. So I'm telling you that now, and it's still, I'm still trying to keep it around $2,000. Uh, Wednesday, we had uh, the, the stuff from, uh, that we've been donated, that we've received from the Nair Corporation, and there's still a good bit of it left over in the fellowship hall, and I would appreciate it if you folks that need something out of that, please take it today, this morning, or tonight, because the school comes back tomorrow, and we'll need to clean those tables off tonight after service. <laughs> Uh, Caleb mentioned that we have a baptism this morning and uh, this young lady sitting over here Amanda she told me last Sunday so we're going to baptize her in Christian baptism this morning and isn't it going to be wonderful for her to go home with the baptism of the Holy Ghost Amen. how many of you believe that's the way it happens you know? uh, I mentioned that tonight the Lord willing at five brother Robert will be preaching and be here but I won't be in service tonight, <clears throat> the Lord willing. Uh, I have a quote I'd like to begin this morning uh, reading. It's uh, in 1955. It's uh, April the 3rd. Uh, it's paragraph 109. I believe there's about three or four paragraphs. Of Chris, it's the last one that I gave you. <clears throat> where it said, I've never believed that, that heaven was a place... Uh, Can't read that fast. I've never believed that heaven was a place where there's a bunch of buildings. Where there's a bunch of houses up there made with mortar, dabbed up with paper, paint on the wall. I've never believed that a supernatural being would have to live in a literal house. I believe when Jesus spoke in John 14 said, In my Father's house is many mansions. He meant a body, a dwelling place. For the scriptures verify the same thing. They say, if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one already waiting. You see it? Mortal beings is the only one who lives in mortal habitations. Immortal beings live in immortal habitations. And the place that we go into until we return back. Now there he's talking about coming back to earth for the millennial reign. Is not a place of brick, mortar, and clay, or precious stones or jewels. It's a place, a condition, that we move out of this dimension that we live into, into another dimension. And it's a house, a tabernacle, a dwelling place. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Now, those in his day thought he's talking about the temple on, on Mount Moriah, but he was talking about his own body. And they thought he was speaking of the Solomon's temple, but he was speaking of his own body. And he's gone to prepare a place for every believer that the very moment we step out of these mortal regions, we don't go into, out into myth or some supernatural spirit, but we go into a tabernacle, a dwelling place. And that's where our brother Vernon Mann went this week. Praise God. We heard just a few weeks ago that he had liver cancer. And I was told yesterday that Brother Vernon had gone into this tabernacle. You know, we, we weep because for ourselves, but Brother Vernon went home. Yes. Something that God had prepared for him. Amen. And that might be right here in this building this morning. In a place that no other radioactivity or nothing can touch. It's there solely fixed by God alone. Listen. Moses had been dead for 800 years. Elijah had been translated for around six or 700 years. And there they stood on the Mount of Transfiguration, both of them in their mortal looks. 
talking to Jesus just before he went to Calvary. See what I mean? Then what am I trying to say? <clears throat> that we're looking at some mythical something, a way off, I chunder, a hundred million years. But what are we looking for? We're looking for a tabernacle that he's gone to prepare for you and I. Now, for the last several weeks, I've been speaking to you on, about subjects that I think need some clarification. You know, Elijah of Malachi 4 was to come and turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. When Jesus speaks of it in Matthew and Luke and so forth, he talks about truly Elisha for a come and restore all things. And we know that that time of restitution that Peter spoke about in Acts 3.21 is in the last days because Jesus was to be received into heaven and retained until the time of restitution of all things. Now, I am not here to correct anything uh, of, of the message. I'm not here to uh, restore anything because that's not my calling. But I, I feel that there are some things that people have confused and, and become mixed up on and got out of balance on because they didn't follow what the scripture said and all that Brother Brown said about a subject. Amen. And, and I, I think that you can go into self-deception with that. You can become so convinced that you've got it figured out that then when the truth comes along, you'll turn it down. Now, to me, the most important thing for us as believers to be looking for is the coming of the Lord. Amen. Now, if somebody comes along and tries to, tries to teach you that the Lord has already come, then it makes it very confusing for you to believe that he's coming. Now, when somebody tries to tell me that the Lord has already come, I ask them, where did Brother Branham say he has come? And I ask them, why does Brother Branham over 40 times after the seals, after February the 28th, after the cloud, does he say we are looking for the coming of the Lord? Amen. I don't think there's anything more important that we as believers can be looking for than the coming of our Lord. Right. Now, to understand this, I, I, I feel that there's a lot of people that they don't understand what he's saying when he says the first coming, the second coming, the third coming. Uh, they're talking about the second coming of the Lord. Well, according to Brother Branham's teachings, Jesus will not set foot on this earth during the second coming. There's three comings of the Lord that Brother Brown talks about from 1949 to 1965, and he hardly changes the wording on it. The first one, he came to redeem us. Yes. Right. That was when he was born in a manger and talked to the men in the temple at 12 and grew up, and at 33, he was crucified. He was buried. He raised from the dead, and he ascended on high. That was his first coming. It was forerun by a prophet with the spirit of Elijah, John the Baptist, fulfilling Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But then there is this second coming that while Jesus is here on earth, according to Brother Branham's quotes, a number of them, he says that Jesus spoke more about his second coming than he did about what he was doing while he's here during his first coming. Yes. In fact, he says 80% of what Jesus taught while he was here was concerning what we call the second coming. When he will not come to this earth in a physical, corporal, literal body, but he will come after us. And the world calls it rapture. Brother Branham in his quotes refers to it as rapture, a catching away. There are many things that happen during that catching away. There's a resurrection. In that resurrection, there's earthquakes. There's signs of the times that happen. Uh, the fig tree has to put forth her leaves before that happens. There's signs of that coming, of that time of being caught away. Uh, the dead in Christ rise. We begin to see them. Amen. 
people begin to disappear. People are missed. It's a secret. Not everybody knows it. That's the second coming of the Lord that Brother Branham mentions over 40 times after the seals. And he tells us we must be looking for that. To me, that is the most important thing that we need to be looking for. Uh, Before the mornings are with the Lord willing, I'll give you some quotes where Brother Branham said, not just every year, not just every month, not just every week, every day, not every hour, but every minute, you need to be looking for the coming of the Lord. Now, we know that, that the first coming was forerun by John the Baptist. We know that Brother Branham's commission at the Ohio River said that John the Baptist was sent to forerun the first coming, so will your message forerun the second coming. Now, we know that was his commission. He was faithful to that. He never denied that. But during Brother Branham's ministry, he brought in this third coming. And that's when he comes back. The first one, he redeemed us. The second one, he comes after us. The third one, he comes back with us. That's the one he just referred to. When he comes back, when we come back. So there's a time when we go away and we meet him in the air. Not here on earth. There's a time when there's got to be earthquakes. There's got to be the dead in Christ. We've got to see them. He says in some places that... We'll see each other before we'll see the Lord. He he talks about how it'll change our faith. And and I I am convinced enough that people have stopped looking for the coming of the Lord. They're not expecting it because somewhere or another in their personality, their mind, their attitude, it's come among us that it's already happened. Brother Bram talks about it. That we've been raised from the dead. We've been resurrected. Sure. And people sure. take that for the present. But Brother Branham, if you're listening, he says that's potentially. Yes. Right. Yes. Do you know the difference in something potentially being? You see, it's just like this. Before the foundation of the world, Christ was crucified. That's the scripture says that. Amen. But he came to this earth and he literally did that. Yes. And he shed his blood on Calvary. Amen. So... I, I want to give you scriptures and quotes. I, I don't want you to have to take my word for it. I want you to hear Brother Branham say it. And, and you may say, well, Brother Green, how many times are you going to tell us that? Brother Branham said, I don't tell it. How many times I hear it, it's still an exciting story. Amen. It never gets old. That's right, right. L- let me ask you, what, what can you think of that would be a greater thing to happen to you than for that trumpet to sound and for that spirit that like a magnet passing over a, a, a machine shop shavings and away you go. What more exciting thing could you have? I again would like to thank those of you that have sent me quotes by fax and phone and, and, and handed them to me and all the other things and if I, if I use your, the quotes you give and the, the scriptures you referred to me, I, I hope you understand it. Well, maybe you'd like to have credit. Brother so-and-so or brother so-and-so. But really, it's amazing how many, how many of them I get two or three from. You know, if we're talking about the truth, everybody ought to be saying the same thing. Amen. It, yeah. it should be coming that way. <clears throat> yeah. I believe there's a time of restitution when everybody's going to understand all the mysteries they're all going to be finished, but really, the, to me, there's one mystery of God. And that's Jesus Christ of the New Testament, Jehovah Amen. God of the Old Testament. That's the one that Moses and Elijah is going to tell the Jews. And, and then, then all these supernatural things are going to come happen in their life. I believe that Israel is a part of this because Brother Bram said that's God's timepiece. I, I think that there were people in the past like the Campbellites and the Christians and the uh, the other people in, in the past, like up at Mount Zion here up by Chicago, there's people up there uh, that they believed they were Elijah and their people believed it and still believe it today. But there was one major part missing when all those people declared those things. And that is that Israel was not at home. But during Brother Branham's ministry, Israel 
became a nation. Yes. Right. Amen. The fig tree put forth her buds. Amen. You know, a lot of people don't understand that, but if you go to the book of Judges, it's chapter 9, verse 4 through 10, you'll find that God spoke about Israel, and he first of all called them an olive tree and talked about the sweetness of their oil and everything. That's when God chose Israel. You know, like it's over in, uh, in Romans when it talks about uh, a, a grafted branch, and that's when he took the Gentiles and grafted them into the olive tree. Uh, that, that's what God always called the Jewish people whenever he declared them to be his people. Second, he calls them a fig tree. Now he does that whenever uh, he refers to them as a nation that uh, they're people that he looks after and he sets up the king and takes them down. Then there's a time when he refers to them as a vine or a vineyard. I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, if you draw from this, and that, that's when he's talking to them about the spiritual things in their life. But then when they're rebellious, he calls them a bramble bush. And so whenever you hear Jesus give this, these seven parables that he does in John... And then he comes along and says, and, and remember when you see the fig tree put forth her leaves, then you know that this time is near. Now, whenever uh, Israel became a nation in 1948, the United Nations had just been formed. And Israel was not a nation. They had celebrated the Passover for centuries. Next year, Jerusalem. Next year, Jerusalem. There had been the Zionist movement that wanted that. But when the United Nations was founded, there was only 49 nations that were members of the United Nations. The first, one of the first actions they did was declared a homeland for Israel. And Israel became the fig tree put forth her buds. But that scripture speaks about and all the other trees. Right. Now you look what's happened to the United Nations since then. There's now 192 nations in there. You saw the Commonwealth uh, of the, the, the British Empire. The sun never set on it. You've seen New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, uh, Canada. All those territories of Britain have become independent nations. Those trees have put forth their leaves. You see all the countries of Africa, all 33 of them, at one time they were under either England like South Africa was or, or the others like Belgium or France, they had, had them there. But all today they're independent. Now where today do you hear any, any country, any ethnic group, anybody wanting to be their own nation, their own country? There's only one and that's the Palestinians. They are wanting to be a tree. They want to have their own nation, their own government. But before 1967, they were Jordan. But it's only to show you that the enemy knows when all these things are fulfilled, the end is on us. Amen. Uh, I look at it and sometimes it appears that the sons of Ishmael will overthrow the sons of Isaac. I can say this, that I don't think we have enough time left in prophecy or in this world for the sons of Ishmael to destroy the sons of Isaac and drive them into the sea or wipe them off the face of the map. I see Bible prophecy doesn't have enough time to start over again. Amen. That's, that's one of the major things that I see that says we've got to be the last generation. We've got to be in the last days Amen. for these things to happen. But then there's got to be a people that's rapture worthy. I can give you a number of quotes where Brother Bram says, I don't see one single thing that's got to happen before the rapture. But yet there's the indication that before he can rapture us, every predestinated seed's got to come in. Not only that, but we're taught adoption. We're taught placement. And I don't think it's going to come on and rapture a bunch of hybrids. 
I think he's going to come and rapture a people that's obedient, Amen. that loves one another, Amen. that's looking for his coming, Amen. that's got oil in their lamps. Yeah. Not just somebody who said, oh, I'm a Christian. I believe in the coming of the Lord. It's going to be somebody who's living it. Right. Somebody that's following the leadership of the Holy Ghost in their life. To do that, they're going to believe in angels. They're going to believe in the supernatural. Sure. They're going to believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Absolutely. But above all, they're going to love one another. Yeah. And they're going to love those that don't love them. Yeah. He's not going to come along and get a bunch of half-baked Christians. No, sir. Just because you're raptured, you're not going to be all of a sudden become that person that you know you should be. No. You've got to be willing to walk in that grace now. Yeah. In that dedication, that life. And you won't do that unless you are really looking for the coming of the Lord. Yes, Jesus gave a parable. He talked about a man who had a vineyard. And he went away on a long journey. And he left it in charge of different people. And when he stayed away longer than what they thought he would. They, they'd be around and say, well, he delays his coming. Well, look, I, you did this wrong. You did this wrong. And they started to fight among themselves. Why did Jesus give us that parable? If if we in this message worldwide really believed that the rapture, the catching away of the bride, the resurrection, the earthquake that will be the last one, the judgment is coming upon this earth, the tribulation. If we really believe that, we wouldn't be fighting each other. That's right. Amen. That's right. We'd be trying to make things right. We'd be trying to live a dedicated, consecrated life of love and self-denial and Christianity. Amen. We wouldn't have any worldliness among us. My goodness. Amen. Can I make that any clearer? No. Unless you're unless you're not self-improvement but unless you're surrendering to the Spirit of God. Yes. You're not looking for the coming of the Lord. My. When I ended last Sunday with that, that Brother Brennan said, I send greetings to Prescott and to Connecticut and to Houston and to Tucson. They're all looking for the coming of the Lord, coming of the Lord, coming of the Lord. You, you all, it spoke to you. Yeah, that's right. But can we stand here today and say they're looking for the coming of the Lord? Yeah. Well, now this group up here, they believe he came. Now this group over here, they believe so-and-so's got this and the others don't have it. I, I'm interested about Tucson Tabernacle this morning. Yes, Are we looking yes. for, to, to make it simple, the rapture? Yes. Right. Amen. Or, or you say, well, it's already happened. You know, well, I want you to show me. No, you can't show me. You can't show me where Brother Branham ever said that. From beginning to end, you, you, can, you can say that, well, it implied that. But Brother Branham told you, don't do that. Amen. In fact, Brother Bram said very plainly, he did not show me the seventh seal. Now, if anybody else has got it, I wonder when they got it and who they got it from. They didn't get it from Brother Bram's tapes. And I'm not being facetious about this. I'm being honest with you. Brother Bram said he did not show me. He, he went at great lengths to go back and show even where Jesus and the scriptures didn't show it. And, and, and where God didn't show it to him. And, and one place he calls it a six-fold mystery. Yes, sir. And then, then when, I, when I dare have the courage to say what I just said, and brothers will take the, the seal book and say, it's the seven seals, Revelation seven seals, not six seals. Well, you know, those are my brothers. I'm not saying something I said. I'm saying what that book said. Amen. It's printed in that book that Brother Bram said he didn't see it. He didn't know it. But, but then, you know, I, I, I know where most of them get it and everything else. But if you're not going to take what Brother Bram said, then what are you going to go by? Yes, sir. Right. You're going to have all kind of confusion. And if you're not careful, it's going to filter right in here. So I want you people to know what Brother Branham said. Amen. Amen. That's the truth. Yes, Lord. Now, let, let me just, no matter how old the story gets, <laughs> it's still the thing you ought to know. 
uh, in a tape in 1960, June the 7th. Uh, Brother, Brother Branham, it's called Hearing and Receiving and Acting. He preached it in, uh, in Ohio. He said, uh, I've never preached nothing else yet but what was in this Bible. Amen. Right. Now, there's, there's some people want to be critical when I say keep your balance in the Scriptures. They say, well, I don't have to find it in the Bible. Well, Brother Bram said he never preached anything that wasn't in the Bible. He said, I stayed right with it. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You said, well, you was a Baptist. I'm a Baptist that received the Holy Ghost. I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I believed in the second coming of Christ. I believe every word that's wrote in that Bible and preach it just the way it's wrote. I don't turn one thing or spiritualize anything. I just say it as it's wrote. That's the way I believe it. I hear it. Recognize it to be God and act upon it. And he said, Amen. Amen. How many of you want that to be your absolute? Now, if, if 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 you've got a quote of Brother Branham's, and you interpret that somehow that it contradicts what the Bible says, Uh-oh. you've interpreted it wrong. Yep. Yeah. Right. Right. Because he said he didn't preach anything that wasn't wrote in the Bible. Amen. And the only reason that I, I enjoy finding it in the scriptures is because it helps me understand what he says. Sure. Yes. Sure. Let, let's go to uh, Philippians chapter 15. Uh, I'm sorry, Philipp, Philippians chapter 3. Verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, that he may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now, I'm I'm going to talk about us personally today, because if the Lord has come, I'm waiting to find somebody without this vile body. Because if Brother Branham believed the Bible, that vile body has had a change. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53 through 57. We read this at almost every internment service we have. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality... There shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How many believe there's going to be a bodily change where this corruption is going to become incorruptible? I'm waiting to see somebody walking around in an incorruptible body. I've had people tell me that they're in the millennium. And I've seen them die. If Satan is bound now, I don't want to be here when he's turned loose. Now, how anybody can continue to believe that, not for one generation, but I have experienced families that have believed it now for the third generation. The grandparents that came up with that revelation are dead in the grave. As the people said when Lazarus, Lord, he stinketh. And maybe there's going to be a resurrection. But now if they want to say, oh, potentially I'm in the millennium, then say it. Don't go around telling everybody you can't die. Sure, you pass from death to life. And, and, and I won't die. But I'm still here. And I still hurt. But I'm looking for something better than this. Amen. Yes, sir. I want the change. Yes, That's the truth. I don't want just the potentiality of it. No. I want the reality Amen. of it. Amen. Come on. Amen. In a message, 1963, April the 12th, the world is falling apart. Paragraph 239. There's only one thing to look for. 
And that's the coming of the Lord. Can you find that in there? It, it was paragraph 239. What, you got 182. All right, let's go to the next one. It, it's, believe me, it's there. There's only one thing to look for. The coming of the Lord. How many of you are going to remember that? Amen. What are you looking for? You're looking for some miracles or some uh, sign or something. The coming of the Lord is what we should have our mind or attention on. Let it be stayed on that. And and the message, look, in Phoenix, Arizona, 63, uh, April the 28th. Uh, And may I point out that both of these are after the seals? Uh Uh-oh. Is that, is that mean of me to do that? I mean, did he not preach the seals in March? And is this, does, does April not follow March? And is Brother Bram telling me that, that I need to know where my thoughts are at? That, that's where your treasures are? That, that's where I need to be? That's the one thing I need to look for? We fix our thoughts our principles and things upon the coming of the Lord. Notice the date, 63, April the 28th. That's a month after the cloud. Two months. Let's go to uh, the same tape, paragraph 258 and 63, 428. And there that bride is looking to the coming of the Lord Jesus. Which that secret coming of Christ shall come and catch away his bride in the night. Like a book I read of Romeo and Juliet one time. How he come with a ladder and got his bride out among them. That's what Jesus will come someday. And looking for that one is not looking to his creeds. But looking to Christ waiting for him to come with his heart centered. You want to look for that? Let's go to the flashing red light of his coming. It's 1963, June the 23rd, paragraph 77. There is no future but the coming of the Lord. Now, I need to point out that up until June the 1st, he had not mentioned the cloud. So these first quotes I read you about looking for the coming of the Lord, Brother Branham didn't mention the cloud. During the seals, he didn't mention the cloud. So I think people have made more out of the cloud than Brother Branham made out of it. Oh, now I know over in 65, he mentioned the face of, of Hoffman's in there. But you never heard Brother Branham talk about that being the coming of the Lord. This is what men have done with it. But, but there's no future but the coming of the Lord. Uh, let's, let's go and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, when Jesus talked about, I go away, I come again, I come after you, where I may be. It was in Acts 1.11, where there 500 people were standing on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus ascends up on high. And two men in white, which they called angels, said, why are you standing here looking? This same Jesus that you see go away shall so come again in like manner. And then you'll see the disciples, Peter, John. You see, they begin to write things about what they remember Jesus said and what they felt themselves. And then when Paul comes along, Paul picks all of it up and he begins to write details about this. Like in 1 Thessalonians, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And he gives more explanation. Well, I want you to know Brother Branham did the same thing. Amen. Brother Branham took what he, he felt that Jesus had said and what Peter, Paul, James, John Everybody else wrote about the coming of the Lord. And Brother Branham wrote his inspiration. 
but he didn't conflict the scriptures. You, 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 can't, you can't find where he did that. But here in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now, Brother Branham, uh, before I'm over with this, I'll give you what Brother Branham calls the last trump. You know, Brother Branham says that Gabriel introduced the first coming of the Lord. Did you know he said Gabriel will introduce the second coming of the Lord? He says the Bible says so. Amen. And somebody tell him where the Bible says Gabriel will announce it. Yep. This Trump. Brother Bram even tells the story. Well, if I had, if I, let, me, let me take a trip to heaven and I go there and I meet Gabriel. He starts talking to Gabriel about how long you've been around here. You're an icon. You know everything goes to heaven. You're, you're the right hand. You're, you're the chief. You do that. And Brother Bram said, it's not Gabriel who comes to me. He says, this angel comes to me. He's a lesser angel. A minor one. A minor angel of healing. But I know people think that brother that was Gabriel come to Brother Brown. But when Brother Brown says it wasn't, what do you do? Oh, yeah. well, he didn't know what he's talking about. Bro, brother Brown said, Gabriel will introduce the second coming. Yeah. Oh, I thought Brother Brown's message was going to do it. But Brother Brown's not going to blow the trumpet. Gabriel's going to blow that trumpet. Don't, don't get upset at me now because I'm going to bring you the quote where Brother Bram says that. Amen. I, I wouldn't dare get up here and say this now with the way my neck's on the block with so many people around the world. <laughs> <coughs> if I say Brother Bram said it, he said it. Yep. Amen. Amen. I don't ask you to take my word. Just look it up yourself. You got a computer. But we shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. I'm waiting for that change. Amen. Let's look at questions and answers. In 1964, August the 30th, and it's uh, page 1113, question number 362. He's asked a question. Please explain the mystery of the translation of the bride. His answer. Just to change. See, our bodies now. Let's say our, you know what I mean when I say that? I don't mean to be sacrilegious. I don't mean to say ours. In other words, just our church. I don't mean to say this church. I mean to say every believer. Amen. And then here's something Brother Brandon mentioned in the rapture tape. Abraham, he was looking for a promised son that was promised to him. Is that right? And the church is looking for a promised son. The bride, is that right? The bride is looking for the promised son. But before the promised son could come to Sarah and Abraham... Their bodies had to be changed. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's the reason I told Sister Green, we're going to start being younger. Yes. And I believe that what I was told by the Lord last Sunday here, this is just trial of my faith right now. Amen. I believe God's Spirit spoke to me and said, my wife's going to be better. Amen. We're going to find this. Amen. We're going to give God the glory for it. Yes, sir. She was too old to have a baby. She had no milk veins in her breast. Her breast was dried up. Her womb wasn't birth. Do you believe Brother Brown really believed that happened to Sarah? Yep. Yes. How many of you people really believe that? Amen. I, I want you to know that, that every time in the Bible when it says all things are possible with God, it's talking about a woman giving birth to a child. With Abraham and Sarah in their old age, nothing is impossible with God. With, with, with Mary, uh, when, when she hadn't been with a man, nothing's impossible with God. And then we quote the other day, all things are possible with God. But every time he's talking about youth, life, birth. You look it up. She's too old to have a baby. She had no milk veins in her breast. Her breast was dried up. Her womb wasn't fertile. She was sterile. She could not have the baby. Her heart was too old to stand labor. So what happened? God changed her back to a young woman. Thank you, Lord, for that example. I believe it's going to happen to all of us. It's coming a day. Because he said his body was as good as dead. And he had to change their body in order to receive the promised son. And we cannot receive the promised son that's promised us today. In these bodies that we live in, these bodies are sin. They're carnal. They're corrupt. 
but there's going to be a change. Yes, we're new creatures in Christ Jesus, in our soul, but our bodies are still sinful, carnal, corrupt flesh. But there's going to be a change. Questions and answers. 1964, August the 23rd, paragraph nine, page 964. We're just to wait on the coming of the Lord. Oh, just wait. Keep your lamps trimmed, all filled with oil. Pray up every hour. Not every day, every hour. Just keep ready. Be ready. Oh, now, uh, why'd you put this on? Why'd you tell us to be sweet? Why don't you tell us we could be careless and unforgetful and unconcerned? Why don't you have to say we had to be sweet and watching? That's it. Yeah. Bow your heads and repent. Because we're not sweet and we're not watching. When our blessed Lord shall come and catch his waiting bride away. Oh, my heart is filled with rapture as I labor, watch, and pray. For our Lord is coming back to earth again. That's it. That's the hope of the church this hour. Now has anybody got a better one? A different one? I don't know about it if it is. Questions and answers. Same tape. Page 1114. So potentially it's in here. And what is it? The word promised before the foundation of the world. And around there, this only reflects the negative. That will reflect the positive, the word. And the same thing is, or the translation of the bride will be the same thing. The word that's in you, the body will materialize around the word. And the same thing did by Sarah. Well, that old body that she had, that first body, it had to be changed in order to produce a son. You get it? That body could not do it. This body cannot do it. So it'll have to be changed the same way to receive the son. Yeah, amen. And now listen folks. Sarah that happened to her. But it didn't happen to every other old lady around. And just because you look around. And there's nobody else changing. Don't you say well I'm as good as they are. Come on, brother. You need to believe what this says. Amen. Amen. There's got to be a change in you. Sixty-three, January the 18th. Now, this is before the seals. Page three, paragraph 330. You'll never see anything happen greater until you see the coming of the Lord. So, what, what can you expect greater? Brother Bram said, not anything greater. Now just remember, surely I know what I'm speaking of or he wouldn't grant the ministry. Don't let it pass now. Are you sincere? Are you looking at it? You expecting it? Next tape is dated January the 20th, two days later. The voice of God in the last days in Phoenix is paragraph 55. Now today, I know it's become the same thing. There's not a thing left, my Christian friend, but the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only hope that the church has, as far as it comes. If it ever takes up a denomination again, it's finished, because every denomination finished when it became a denomination. That's the very thing. Let's look now in August after the seals, 825, paragraph 61, how can I overcome? And now, at the coming of the Lord Jesus, those who are really loving His coming, Amen. Amen. That's living for it. Amen. Amen. When He appears in the sky, the church that's dead in Christ shall rise, and those will be changed in a moment. Now, the cloud was in the sky. We all got pictures of it. But did you hear of anybody being raised from the dead? Well, that right there ought to be enough to convince us that was not what Brother Bram's talking about. 
The rest of them will know nothing about it, remember? Appear to those in the city. See, the rapture will be like that. We'll see each other and we'll see them. You know anybody that saw the dead in Christ? The rest of the world won't see them. It'll be caught away as a secret going. Waiting for that time. Then returning back to the earth for that glorious millennium. That's Revelation 19. That's the third coming of the Lord. The thousand years, the rest of the dead live not for a thousand years. Desperation, 1963, September the 1st, paragraph 55. Remember the coming of the Lord will be a sudden secret going away. He'll come and take her like a thief in the night. And to think that if somebody all of a sudden, there's members of our family gone and you're left behind. Again, I ask you, did you lose any loved ones? Did you know where they are? Well, isn't that a shame? Not a one of us had any relatives that went missing. Everybody missed it. I'm not making fun. I'm just showing you how silly some people believe the coming of the Lord is. Sirs, we would see Jesus after the seals, November the 12th, paragraph 10. And I truly believe that we're just facing some great event. I trust it's the coming of the Lord. We know something has to give way. The world is under too much tension. And there's something wrong. Everyone knows that. And I believe that we're facing some great thing. And I believe with all my heart that it's the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And I trust that he will pour out his spirit upon us. And will reveal to us the things that we should do to be prepared for his coming. How many of you will agree with that last statement? God revealed to Perry Green what I need to do to be prepared for that coming. Amen. Brother Bram says, There's only two, you be one of them. <clears throat> Influence, 1963. After the seals. November the 14th. Paragraph 198. A statement in there says. I don't see nothing to hinder. The rapture of the church. Right now. Amen. Brother Bram. Didn't you know it happened. In February. March. Testimony. 1963, November the 28th, Thanksgiving in Shreveport, paragraph 29. I only see one thing left, the coming of the Lord Jesus at any time, a rapture for the church, and we're to meet him in the air. Amen. The token, Shreveport, Louisiana, 1128, paragraph 105. And he will appear the second time to all those that love his appearing. Amen. And I bring this one because there's so many says, well, he's appeared, he's come. There's a difference in the appearing and a difference in the coming. Brother Brown implies that with the church doing the things that Jesus did. That was God making himself appearing in his believers. But Brother Brown here is talking about the Lord where you can see him. Amen. Or maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe I should just say, let you read it and you decide what it says. He will appear the second time to all those that love his appearing, who love and longing for it. It's a love affair. And how we ought to love one another. You can't be loving him unless you love one another. Because we're fellow citizens in the same body, we should have love one for another. In the message of trial, Tucson, Arizona, 1964, March the 27th, paragraph 168. He's having a trial here, and he says, I believe, Court, I want to say something to you this afternoon, that I don't see one thing to hinder him from coming right now, that the world, if I had time, I could prove it to you, is setting perfectly, even by names and position, the way it's supposed to be setting when he comes. 
When is the hour? I know not. No one knows. But he said, when these come to pass, look up. Israel's in her homeland. Everything is sitting just exactly right for his coming. Amen. Recognizing your day. 64, July the 26th, paragraph 66. As a minister of the gospel, I can't see one thing left but the coming, going of the bride. Now, is there anybody here that doubts that statement? How many times do I have to read, Brother Bram said, I don't see one thing to happen until that. Do I have to prove that anymore? Or is that enough? Amen. Well, then, why is he talking about that if it's already happened? Wouldn't he be misleading us? If you're saying, I, I don't see anything to happen but that, but really, folks, it's already happened. Broken Cisterns, 1964, July the 26th, paragraph 12. Some people might be under the impression that I think that Jesus is going to come in the morning or tonight. I, I, I do. Now, I don't say that he will. And again, he may not come for next week, and it might be next year. It might be 10 years. I believe it's been over 40. I don't know when he's coming, but there's one thing I want to always you bear in mind. You be ready every minute or hour. Then if he doesn't come today, he might be here tomorrow. So just keep that in your mind that he's coming. And I don't know what time he's going to be my last hour on this earth. Neither does any of us. And there is none of us know when he is coming. He doesn't even know himself. By his own words, he said, the father only knows when he will come. Not even the son knows when he will come. It's when God sends him to us again. But we're looking for his coming. And if he doesn't come in my generation. Well. Brother Bram, didn't you know he's already come? He might come in the next. If he doesn't come in that one, he'll come in the next. But for myself, I can't see hardly any time left. To me, it could happen at any minute. Now that don't mean, that doesn't mean now that You'll see the heavens change and every. That's not the coming I'm speaking of. I'm talking of the rapture. Amen. Right. Right. So if it was that one that's spiritualized or you're caught up in a state of ecstasy or something, Brother Bram said, he didn't make it. He's still looking for it. Just two or three more. Or are you tired of them? Just another page. But have I convinced you Amen. that you're not enthused enough about the coming of the Lord? Yeah, come on. Amen. Broken Cisterns, 1964, July the 26th, paragraph 15. When he comes this time, hardly none but those who are ready will know when he comes. There'll just be an absence of people. They won't know what happened to them. And I've had this quote given to me. Well, you know, it happened and you didn't know anything about it. Well, neither did you. They won't know what happened to them. They'll just be caught away in a moment. And that they just come up missing. But I have traveled the world among the believers of this message. And I've never heard one testimony where somebody come up missing. Maybe we're following the wrong prophet. Maybe he came to somebody else. I don't believe that. Easter Seal, 1965, almost the end. March the 10th, paragraph 281. We're under a great anticipation. First, the coming... No, the Easter seal. It's 65, 410. Can't you see spirit-filled people? Something fixed to happen. Don't look for some great big universal thing. Sweeping nothing but the coming of the Lord Jesus. Remember, just remember the words and promise of the Lord. 65, 427, paragraph 124. There's not another thing that I know to happen but the rapture. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's already. 
I want you to see how close we get to the end of Brother Bram's life. Next one, what is the attraction? July the 25th, paragraph 5. This is what I read you last week. Sends greetings all over America. Everybody's on a telephone hookup. Looking for the coming of the Lord. Amen. Brother Mercer's group. Can I, can I say again, are we looking for the coming of the Lord? Amen. I want this vile body changed. Amen. I want this corruption to become incorruptible. Yes, I want to experience that without experiencing death. Yes. You people seeing me patted in the face with a shovel at a cemetery. I believe there's some of us that's alive and remain. Amen. We're going to experience that change yes. and be caught up to meet our Lord Amen. in the air. Amen. Now before that happens, I believe there's going to be a resurrection. Yes, sir. And at the time of that resurrection, I believe there's going to be an earthquake. Amen. And we'll bring you those scriptures. But I'm going to tell you, I don't think you need to wait till the earth is trembling under your feet to say, oh, I believe. I think there are going to be people weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. Why didn't I look for his coming? Why didn't I love one another? Why didn't I get ready? Why was I so caught up in my own revelation and understanding of things that it wouldn't have anything to do with anybody else? Why did I become a denomination? And that's what a denomination is when you put everybody else out that don't agree with you. God bless you. I hope it's clear that you should be looking for the coming of the Lord. All right. Who's going to baptize Amanda? Newton, you feel like doing it, or Caleb? And I guess it's up to you. I guess I'll lead some worship songs in. <clears throat> I got about another three or four minutes here. I want to show you something, though. You know, we listened uh, for four Wednesday nights about the Feast of the Lord. And there's some scriptures in the Old Testament, like in uh, Joel 2.31, I think it is. It says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. How many of you believe that God uses the sun and the moon for signs? You know, Brother Bram, when he's talking about the church ages and all, the Pope going to, to Israel and all, there was the moon, he used it for signs. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 through 6 it says but the times and the seasons brethren you have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief uh, in the night for when they shall say peace and safety then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape but you brethren are not of the darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're all children of the light and the children of the day. And we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. How many believe we should do that? Amen. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, saying, Worry is he that's born king of the Jews, for we have seen his star in the east. There's a time where the Bible tells us that men saw a star and they come to know and recognize the first coming. Isaiah 61 and 2. When Jesus picked up that scroll and he said to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. And Brother Branham in the message, this day this scripture is fulfilled, showed us that Jesus fulfilled the first part of that and the second part would be fulfilled to proclaim the day of vengeance. How many of you believe that, that, that the world will be warned of that? Amen. All right, Revelation chapter 12, verse 2. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should fear, feed her 
1,203 score days. How many know the Bible talks about 1,290 days? You see, the Jewish people are given certain times. Like, like in the third day, Brother Bram said in Hosea, 2,300 years before that happened. But the Gentiles, we're given, well, in due season or in time to come or when this prophecy came to pass. But Israel's given specific times. Uh, so we read this in Revelations 12, 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness and to her place where she is nourished for time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And that's 1260 days. That's three and a half times 360. That's three and a half years, which we talk about the tribulation. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince should be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now, maybe you know that Brother Brown, my church age, I laid that out. 49 years from the time that, uh, that they started that till the time they rebuilt the temple. And I only read you those to show you that there is a time. Now, when you come to this and you get this uh, 49 weeks and you take seven times seven equals 49 years. You got that? Okay. Then you take seven weeks of years leading up to a jubilee calendar which the Old Testament does. But uh, you know I've always said if we know the beginning day we can come out with the ending day. Yeah. You know it's, it, it's like the feast of the tabernacle. We know the beginning day we can know the end of the day. But if you take June the 7th, 1967. You know, anybody, anybody know what happened on that day? Jerusalem was no longer trodden under the foot of the Gentiles that day. There was 48,000 Arabs and Gentiles lived in the city of Jerusalem on that day. And on June the 7th, 1967, when Israel captured it and took it over, they expelled, evicted everybody out of the city. And for three days, nobody walked the streets of Jerusalem but Jews. Now, maybe you didn't know that fact. But I've always thought that was sort of a prophetic thing that happened. Because the Bible does say something about Jerusalem being trodden under the foot of the Gentiles. Yeah. But I, I was given this chart this week, and I thought this interesting enough to share with you. Chris, can you show that? Yeah, you got it. Look at Look at 1967, and if you count up the days that was left in September, there was from, the, from June, there was 23 days. Then you take July, August, September, October, November, June, you got 207 days in 1967. Then you take 68, 69, all the way up through that to 2014, you got 17, 374, but you take 215, you got that? There on the end of it, 2015, and you put 243 days, you got 17,616 days. Now that's that's 49 years. That's what the scripture talks about here. And that day, August the 31st, I'm sorry, September the 28th. No, no, put you on September the 23rd. See it on the very bottom there? Put you on September 23rd, 2015, on Yom Kippur Day. And you know what? There's a lunar eclipse that day. That's what got my attention. I was looking up the lunar eclipses between 2011 and 2020, and I found that one September the 23rd, and then I find this other chart, and it's all together, and it come out to be coincide the days. Well, Brother Green saying the Lord's coming September the 23rd, 2015. Let me tell you what I've always told you. If somebody comes along and sets a date on you, and it in any way causes you to be closer to God, it didn't hurt you. Not at all. But I don't know, maybe you weren't even interested in that, but I was. That, that got my attention. It had been on Yom Kippur Day and a lunar eclipse on the same day. 
that, you know what, covers almost every nation on earth. And it lasts for almost three hours. It's a big eclipse. It's almost total. Remember what Brother Bram said, when the moon goes out, it's a sign of the church. The light going out. Are you ready, Caleb? No. I love him, I love him because he first loved me. Yes, I love him. 